bipartisan solution for Medicare. Yeah, That's look, it. I'll just say real briefly, Tom, Tom summed it up very well. I mean, it happens as a matter of record that I voted against the Part D because uh, for a couple of reasons, one of which was I thought the government ought to be able to negotiate uh, drug prices uh, with, the comp with the drug companies as we do in other programs such as the VA. But, uh, you know, if people want to put that on the table as part of this and have a discussion, that's, that's what the process is all about. Senator Lieberman, um, this plan has a lot of things that Democrats would find painful, raising the retirement age from Medicare to 67, uh, higher premiums for all enrollees, you know, uh, Democrats have generally been okay with some kinds of means testing. How do you get Democrats to sign on to a plan like this when Republicans, other than Senator Coburn, haven't been willing to come to the table on revenues? Well, two things. I mean, look, if you'd asked me five years, certainly ten years ago, would I be supporting a plan like this to change Medicare, I would have said I can't imagine doing that. But as, as I study the numbers, it seems to me that the alternative to this plan is not to continue to go along with the status quo. The status quo leads to the collapse of the entire Medicare program and really terrible suffering by the people who depend on it. And now it's almost 50 million Americans going up close to 70, or actually over 70 million uh, in the next decade or so. So what I would say to Democrats about some of the parts of this that, that are strong medicine, as I said, Yes, they are, but, but what's on the other side of it is that this program is going to get very sick uh, if, you don't, if we don't take this medicine. The other thing to say is that Tom and I had some very good discussions, and while, while you can't say that there are tax increases in here, incidentally, the Health Care Reform Act already did increase um, the, the Medicare tax on um, Americans who make over $250,000, but this has some pretty progressive parts to it. I mean, we're, we're asking wealthier Americans to pay more uh, than people who don't uh, have as much money. And uh, we do it within the Medicare system, and I think that's a fair way to go. Senators, um, you lay out in here the different brackets that they're going to be paying for out-of-pocket costs. And my question is, you give dollar amounts, so won't these have to change constantly with how the economy is swinging? or with inflation in general? They will have to change with inflation, and that'll be a detail that we'll discuss when we actually write the, the legislation. Okay. But it, 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 look, it, the answer, what, the proposal, we're going to have all sorts of questions like this gentleman just asked. What is the option? You know, the option is not to do nothing. The option is, is how do we find a way forward that preserves a Medicare in a way that we can get it through Congress that also preserves the country. <clears throat> what's our, what's our, in the long term, what's our, going to be our largest cost for the federal government? It's going to be Medicare. It's the biggest. And if you don't we go after the biggest first and try to make sensible reforms to it, nobody's, nobody's going to like this plan. We understand that. <clears throat> but Nobody wants the present Medicare to vanish and those that are absolutely dependent on it to not have anything. Just think about it. Let's say if the, the trustees are right in 2016, Part A trust funds belly up, and we haven't solved our other problems. What's going to happen? Do you think we're going to come in with a, a, you know, a pail of water to douse the fire and fix it then? And how much pain, more painful will it be then if we don't make some of these smaller adjustments now? The other thing is, is we have to reconnect. Look, you'll never control the cost of health care in this country till you reconnect some of the purchase of that health care with the individual. And, and it, it, it just doesn't work because everybody thinks somebody else is paying for their health care. And it doesn't. that's not just in Medicare. That's everywhere. And that's one of the reasons we don't have any control on the cost of it. One out of three dollars spent in health care in this country doesn't help anybody. And the reason it doesn't is because there's not a market force. And we're just putting a little bit of market force in this, but we're saying everybody gets to share in trying to solve the problem, <coughs> from the very wealthy to even those. The only ones that won't will be the dual eligibles. How much of a $600 billion <laughs> goes for the three-year doc fix? I mean, this is that, and it's probably pretty expensive. It seems to me you won't have that much left over to shore up Medicare's long-term finances. No, it's not. The total 10-year fix for the doc fix is about $275 billion. 
but that most you know that grows each year as we have more and more people in it. So the the numbers are actually fairly small for the first three years compared to that total number. I can't agree. Josh, what was it? It was forty something. Forty billion. Forty billion, 40 billion. <clears throat> for the first for the three, three years. years. Senator, do you assume the uh, continuation of the health care legislation that passed last year? Yes. Senator Coleman, you voted to repeal it, haven't you? Yes, I have. So how do you reconcile that? Well, the assumption is, is if, if, for example, we have in here the, the age progression to, to Social Security age, if it's repealed, then that we put an exception for that uh, in our bill, so that we won't. If if the, if the Affordable Care Act continues, then that age requirement will go up, and we we have the availability to put them in the exchanges. But if it goes away, then we're not doing it. So there are no exchanges. So where would those folks get insurance? Well, we we. The, we're, we don't change the age, so they have the same. It doesn't change. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <coughs> Senator Lieberman, in, yes. when you outlined this in the Washington Post op-ed, there was a 1% tax on people <laughs> making over $250,000 a year. So is that gone now? It is, and that was part of the negotiating gone. process. I mean, that was... Uh, that was, would have been an increase in income tax on people making over 250000 And in the negotiations we conducted, uh, you know, I think we agreed that we could agree on uh, finding other ways to ask wealthier people to give uh, more to preserve Medicare. And we've done it, for instance, by requiring them to pay 100 percent of uh, the, the premium cost for Part B and D, the doctors and prescription drugs, w which the taxpayers pay most of uh, now, and uh, we have a much higher um, maximum out-of-pocket on Part A for wealthier Americans. And again, I want to stress that uh, because the 2.9 percent Medicare tax now uh, uh, covers all income, it's a progressive tax, and the health care reform bill made it even more progressive by adding another 0.9 percent for people over 250,000. So that was part of the process of negotiating to be able to bring us together today. Senator, how, how do you now make this a part of the debt ceiling uh, discussions that are going on, or, or is that the vehicle for this? Or are you considering maybe doing it outside of the discussions uh, and, and <coughs> trying to, try to uh, seek passage that way? Well, look, you know, we're going to uh, send copies of this, of course, to the White House and to the bipartisan leadership. Uh, in fact, to all the members of the Senate, and uh, when I asked Tom the other day, what do you think we should do at first after the press conference? He said, try to get a couple of other senators to join us, uh, and that's pretty direct. But, uh, I mean, at least in the midst of a, a time here, I, I tell you, I, I, I find that a lot of our colleagues are, um, I hate to use the word depressed, I don't mean it in a clinical way, but they're downcast <laughs> about it because I'm, I'm a lawyer, not a psychiatrist. <laughs> but uh, they're really uh, uh, downcast about the, the failure of the process here uh, as we head toward the uh, debt ceiling vote. And uh, perhaps we offer a little hope that at least two of us can get together across party lines, but I think there are a lot of others, I hope, who will, who will want to do something similar. Um, at a minimum, maybe we, we have offered some ideas here that, uh, that, the, uh, that the vice president's process, or now the president's, uh, will want to consider as, as part of an ultimate agreement. You want to add anything? Senator, last you question. Do you think there will be significant overhaul of Medicare as part of the debt ceiling, via this or, or some less substantial overhaul? Well, as Tom said, and I said in my opening statement, you're simply, th this, the Medicare, the, the, int the mandatory spending or entitlements are the biggest drivers of our debt as we go forward. Already unbelievably high, $14 trillion. So we're not going to get anywhere near back to balancing our federal budget unless we deal with the entitlements. So, I, you know, it's just a question of when. The sooner the better, because if, if we don't do this, when we finally have to, and if it's in the middle of a financial meltdown, it's going to be impossibly painful <laughs> for individual uh, enrollees in Medicare and for our, for our country. So. Uh, it's time to, it, it, the sooner you take the strong medicine, the, the sooner you'll get healthy again. Uh, if you don't take it, you know, the results are not so, not so good. But here I'm going over to the doctor's uh, area of expertise. Well, I just, look, Medicare has to be fixed. We have to change it. You can live in la-la land and say, no, it's going to stay the same. It isn't going to stay the same. Even if the Congress doesn't do anything, it isn't going to stay the same because we're not going to be able to borrow the money to afford it. 
And, and what, what people don't realize, there's a debt wall coming in the world. It's going to hit next July. Where the world's demand for sovereign debt is $13 trillion and the world's liquidity to fund it is $9 trillion. If we don't have our house in order by that time, every American, whether you're in Medicare or not, is going to suffer precipitously. We need to be about fixing that. This is a component to fixing it. And we need to shake the political shackles and start doing what's best for the country, not what's best for any party or who's going to get in power. It's not going to matter who's in power when that happens. We're going to be told what we're going to do if, in fact, we want to fund any of the basic things that we have. So, you know, it's critical that we, and it's critical that people like Joe and I come together and give up, some, you know, we, he gave up something, I gave up some significant things. <clears throat> when you see my $9 trillion program, you'll see where I really would like to see us go. <clears throat> but we, we, we think, walking together, talking, calling it the truth about what it is, you have to fix Medicare, and if you don't, you can't fix our country. Now's the time to do it, and now's the time to do it in a bipartisan fashion. Thank you very much.